All right, good evening again. We are ready to start lesson one, Eli and Samuel, in the uh, book. It's the year two book. And I've already made this pretty big, so let me know if that's not big enough to read. All right. So we're going to start off with uh, 1 Samuel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 28. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives, the name of one was Hannah, and the other, oh, and the name of the other, Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her arrival also provoked her severely to make her miserable, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was, year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come, to his head, come upon his head. And it happened, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Then they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked for him from the Lord. And Samuel means heard by God. Now the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned, then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. So Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. Now some translations say let the Lord confirm your word, meaning that making sure that she keeps her promise is basically the idea. 
Just make sure you keep your, your word. Then the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. Now, when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with a, okay, with, now here's where mine says three bulls and another one says one three-year-old bull, which I think is actually correct because then they sacrificed one bull. But it's okay. Either way, she took a sacrifice with her, which was the bull, one eth of a flower and a skin, uh, I'm sorry, flower, not flower, I guess. I say flower and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young. Then they slaughtered a bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worshiped the Lord there. Now, where she says lent, other things say granted or given or, you know, that kind of thing, dedicated to the Lord, because that was her, that was her agreement when she prayed and asked for a son. So, going all the way back to the beginning, the first question, number one, even though in a civil sense he was an Ephraimite, they listed that back in, in verse one, of what tribe was Elkanah and his son Samuel by birth and descent? And I do have the, the Chronicles verses if, if we want to look at those. Does anybody remember right off though? Okay, so the Chronicles verses back in chapter 6, and I did verses 33 through 38, because I think that pretty much tells you. Um, they're listing, well, I'll just tell you, and these are the ones who ministered with their sons of the sons of the Kohathites, or Kohathites, no, Kohathites, Kohathites, were Heman the singer, and now it's going to give his ancestry, which is the son of Joel, the son of Samuel, the son of Elkanah, and then we're going to go through some more son ofs, and I'm going to kind of bypass that and go down to the son of Levi, the son of Israel. So they were Levites. They were in the tribe of Levi. They were descended from Kohath. That's, that's the name of uh, the son of Levi. Okay. It does make sense for because he had, he needed to be a priest, didn't he? To be, I mean, he needed to be a Levite to be one of the priests, correct? So, yeah, that does make sense. Okay. So, number two, describe Elkanah's family. Yeah, just describe Elkanah's family. I guess. What would you say? He was a guy with two wives and children from one wife and none from the other, right? Okay, so then we get to the, the probably the more important thing. How is this passage a demonstration of the evil consequences of polygamy? So how would you say this caused problems? Or Well, we see where Anna was barren. The other lady wasn't. And she held it over her. It made her feel really bad. Right. It did cause contention or strife between the two. Made me think of Abraham and Sarah and Haggai. Yep, if you go back to them. And if she had a son, Sarah was not able to conceive for a while. And that's why she gave Haggai to him. And didn't Isaac have the same problem with his wives, where he had two wives and and one one was fruitful right off and the other wasn't? And that was... Huh? So Isaac didn't have that issue? He had Rebecca. Jacob had Leah and Jacob had Rachel. Leah and Rachel. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, what I'm getting at is didn't this problem, every time you had somebody with multiple wives, didn't these same problems keep occurring? That's what I was getting at. Yeah. Leah had children before Rachel did. And, right. And then there's some Drake's like Swan thing story about that. I, I kind of get lost in this show. Well, I, I was just, yeah, because... 
every it seems like every time we see polygamy, um, one wife is mean to the other. One wife seems to think they have it over the other. And and I think it would be the same if it was one woman and multiple men. I think you would still have the same problem. Uh, and it just seems to create competition and issues where we wouldn't want any, you know. And we see where in the New Testament, God uh, permitted some things, but now he, he uh, wants all men to repent. In other words, only one wife and one man. Well, yeah. If, I can't remember. I thought there was an actual verse for that, too. Maybe more than one verse. But anyway, yes. Um, Solomon had a lot of wives. He did. He was a wise man, but was he really? <laughs> well, he had his problems, too. He was flawed, like I guess the rest of us, because he ended up with wives. And did he have concubines as well as wives? I can't remember. But it seems like he had a lot of issues. Oh, 700 wives and 300 concubines. Okay, that boggles my mind. I don't even know what to say to that. That's just... Wow, okay. Maybe his wisdom was that he had so many they couldn't be jealous because he never knew which one he was going to be with. I guess. Wow. So, okay. Um, all right, so let's move on to question number three. Now, why did Elkanah's family go to Shiloh every year? To worship the Lord and offer sacrifice. If we, if we look up the uh, verses mentioned here, basically, um, I'll do the short one, Exodus 34, 23. Three times in the year, all your men shall appear before the Lord, the Lord God of Israel. And then the second... Um, Reference they have there, Deuteronomy 16, 16. Um, they shall not appear. I'm reading this the last of it. It basically says the same thing. Three, three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses. And it mentions the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, at the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. So they were going to make sacrifice to the Lord. And this was where the tabernacle was, according to the verse we read earlier. Yeah, the temple hadn't been built yet. Yeah, the temple had not been built, and I guess the tabernacle was at Shiloh at this time. So, okay. Did anybody have anything else on that? No? Okay. Uh, why was sa why was Hannah sad? No, ch no child, huh? That's right. She had no child. She had no children at all. And uh, and the other woman was not nice to her either. So I mean that compounded it. You know, if you want to. So number five. Now, Hannah's prayer is not really in all these verses, but all these verses contain the prayer and other stuff. Describe Hannah's prayer found in verses 9 through 18. What things can you say about her prayer? Let's put it that way. She humbled herself before God, and she didn't blame him for being barren. Man. And she asked for his help, yep. and she gave him she gave her, him her promise what she would do with that child. Yes. Right, she did. She, I, I put down in a way she made a deal, but it was, uh, well, uh, to me, huh? Maybe a vow. It was a vow. It was, it really sounded like, what, what did they call it back in numbers? The, uh, does anybody remember? The, the Nazarite vow? It really sounds like she's pledging him to be like, and not just for a time, but like for all his life to be living that Nazarite vow. At least I didn't see any indication that it was limited. It was like for his entire life, from, from what I remember what she said. So, there's one other thing, and that's that her prayer was silent. 
She didn't really say it out loud. It was a silent prayer, even though her, her lips moved and Eli thought she was drunk, but she didn't really say anything out loud. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah. That's true. It, it was. It was very emotional. It was a very impassioned plea. That's true. That she was. She really had a lot of emotion in that. I don't find that strange at all because that's the way my prayers are. Good. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Our, our prayers should be emotional, I guess, in the sense that we are. Um, sincere and fervent, right? Yeah. She must have uh, kept her feelings to herself, and it was just so much that she was just overcome. She must not have shared this with anybody else, her husband or maybe a friend. Maybe in those days they didn't. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, from the way Elkanah asked her, I don't know if he was really aware or if he just knew about it and was, because he did say that about, uh, you know, basically, ain't I better than 10 sons? So so he, he was at least aware of the issue. But that's not the same as having somebody to really talk about things and confide in necessarily. So It's good because uh, it gives us the uh, feeling that we can go to God in prayer too and ask for things. And that, that is the case. That is good. Because we can go to God in prayer and let him know what's on our hearts. I don't know. A silent, a silent prayer, you're not, you're not worrying about words. You're, it, it's direct. Right. Yeah. It, it would be. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, let's see. So, how was her prayer answered? Well, the Lord remembered her and she had a child. Right. The Lord remembered her and she had a child. She had a son and named him Samuel. Now, let's see. Uh, question number six. What was Hannah's vow? I may have already talked about that, I guess, a little bit. Sorry. But um, basically, she had said that he would be dedicated to the Lord, right? And that it was a, he would be separated wholly for the Lord and that no razor would touch his head. In other words, he is, his head would not be shaved or his hair would not be cut. If we look at Numbers uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, that's where the Nazarite... This is basically a little short summary of the Nazarite vow. There's a lot more you can read about it. But then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When either a man or woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and similar drink. He shall drink neither vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from similar drink, Neither shall he drink any grape juice, nor eat fresh grapes or raisins. All the days of his separation he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grape grapevine from seed to skin. All the days of the vow of his separation no razor will come upon his head until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself to the Lord. He shall be holy. Then he shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. So, and that's just the first five verses. There are more. There is more that you can read about that. So, and how did she fulfill her vow? Right. She took Samuel once he was weaned. Right. She took Samuel uh, back to her not back, but to the tabernacle and presented him to Eli, the priest that was there, and gave him to that. Yes, Shirley. Um, I have two questions. 
Okay. Um, just out of curiosity and, and maybe just a little fact, what do they consider being weaned? What age would they be weaned? And also when Samuel was taken back to the temple, who took care of him? Who would be in charge of him? Well, because I think that she left him there. That's yes. how I'm reading it, that she no longer had contact with him. She dedicated his she dedicated him to the Lord. I'm not sure of how long they took to wean back then. Do you have something, Judy? I, I was just going to uh, say that today it's more likely to be one or two years old, but it used to be like like a long time. It, it, he may well have been at least five. Oh, okay. Yes. Was, oh, go ahead. For one thing, it was part of a... Uh, way of not getting pregnant to go ahead and, and nurse your child. Uh -huh. A lot of times it worked that way. Okay. If we yes. go back to uh, Isaac, uh, Sarah weaned him and Abraham had a weaning party and we see that um, Ishmael, Hagar's child, made fun of um, Isaac and I, I believe it says he was three. Okay, so so at okay, so at Isaac's weaning party, he was three. So most likely, I mean, if we figure they followed certain traditions, like Judy is saying, three or maybe even a little older, we're not sure. Yes. We also see that Moses was kept with his mother because you know the sister Miriam found him, and mm -hmm. you know the story. Yes. And so then she weaned him and then she gave him back. So he might have been about the same age. Right. Okay. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure of what Moses' age was, so that's something, yeah. All right. So it sounds like he would have been at least three, probably, and that, that I was leaning towards two or three, but it you would think he would need to be old enough to get around a little bit, but I, Eli would have been being the head priest, at least they, the way this reads, Eli at that time was the, what do they call it, the chief priest or the high priest? I'm sorry, the high priest. And uh, he would have been ultimately in charge, but I'm sure he would have handed the child off to someone else on a, you know, for a regular daily basis for somebody to watch after him. But I, it doesn't say clearly. Yes, surely. Correct then in thinking that Hannah actually turned this child over to Eli, and she no longer had any. She was no longer the mother of him. I don't what? know how I want to put it, but she had no contact with him at all. Oh, well, it seems like that is such a young age to leave a child somewhere, and someone else's hand. Um, I'm not disputing it. I'm just trying to understand it. Right, right. When if we I'm not disputing this at all. Right. I, I'm just trying to understand what went what went on in those days. It doesn't suit what we would do, I know. If you read on though, she does go back and we know for certain that she goes back and sees him at times. She from for him every year. She like she updates his robe every year because he's growing. So she's giving him a, a newer or bigger, however you want to think of it, robe every year. From the way it reads. He must have really cherished that too. But other than that, yeah, he was dedicated to the Lord's service. So, I mean, and it does talk about him growing up, uh, maturing. Not, not in a great deal, but it does mention it some, that he's, you know, maturing and growing And it's, it's because of the vow she made. I mean, if she hadn't have made that vow, that wouldn't even been, but she made that vow. And once you made a vow to the Lord back then, 
you you really had to keep it. I mean, now we get all wishy washy and just. By uh, 18, 218, it starts telling about Chapter 2, verse uh, 18. Uh, if you look at 18 and, and I guess 19, Samuel ministered before the Lord even as a child wearing a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. It does not really say that she saw him more than once a year. It's possible she did. It's possible that she didn't. I they went, don't. They went three times a year, though. The guy, yeah, the guys had to go three times a year, so she would have had at least three opportunities. Yes. I wonder in verse uh, twenty if, if that is implying that the Lord <clears throat> blessed Hannah with more children. Yeah, as you read on, she did have more. She did have more children. I think even in the net, yeah, in verse 21, uh, the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. So she had more children after that, yeah. Is it possible that Eli's son, Hophni and Phinehas, that they were married and they had wives, and that perhaps, or any of the other um, priests or Levites may have. Sort of cared for him. It's possible that one of the one of the priest's wives could have even Eli's wife if she was still alive, because he had he had sons who were serving as priests as well. So it's quite possible that one of the women there, one of their wives, took care of the child. Just to be a fly on the wall. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, just to go back we and. Don't know all the no, it's not. It's not clearly laid out how they handled young Samuel, except that he he did he did perform some service though, because even as a child, it says, "But the child ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest." So, and I think Eli was watching over his training and things of that nature, from the way it reads. Do you have something, Jim? Well, all the time that he is there with the priest, he's learning. Right. So he's there learning those duties. Yeah. Yeah, so they were teaching him and training him from the whole time he was there because that was going to be his purpose, to, to be a priest and to be dedicated to the Lord. And we know he becomes a prophet and everything, but uh, at this point, he's still uh, basically a child. All right, so we are... Out of time for this evening. Unless anybody has anything else, Shirley, I'm sorry, I wasn't trying to I wasn't trying to cut you off or anything like that. So I want to thank you for your time though. So tomorrow being Thanksgiving, and actually just all the things we've looked at and studied just make uh, keeps making me think of how we should be thankful. To the Lord for all the all the blessings and all the things, all the little things we have. If we look at Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10, for who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. Now this verse refers to the start of the building of the second temple, and it, it was a small start, and it was kind of looked down upon by people, and even some of the Jews thought poorly of their start of this building. But they would rejoice in the completion of it. And sometimes we don't appreciate the small things, or we don't appreciate how things get started out, because a lot of things have little beginnings, but everything starts somewhere. If we look at Job chapter 8, verse 7, now this is actually Bildad speaking, 
Though your beginning was small, yet your latter end would increase abundantly. And he's saying with God that our small beginnings are okay. The Lord will raise up the humble, the insignificant, and make something out of it. He'll, he'll help us to grow. And so that's how it is when we start with Christ. We all start small. We all start humble in the beginning. But if we remember what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now that's just part of his sentence to the Philippians where he's thanking God for them and he's thanking them for their support and partnership in the mission of the gospel. The body of Christ was really small at that time. It was just starting out. It looked like they had an impossible hill to climb with needing to spread the good news of Jesus throughout the world and throughout a very pagan world that did not believe and did not know God. But their attitude toward God and their faith helped them. If we look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. So their focus, and this is Paul speaking, their focus, focus was on spreading the gospel. And so we're here today after that small beginning. And we should give thanks for the small things in our lives. Maybe the things that slip our minds and we take them for granted. But if we think about them, we do appreciate them. We do thank the Lord for them. And maybe some of the things that we take for granted we don't think of, maybe they're not all so small. But if we look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 10, When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. That's especially ap applicable to tomorrow, to Thanksgiving. You know, some of us will be eating and getting full and passing out on the couch. So that's, you know, we should thank God for that. Isaiah chapter 38, verses 18 and 19. For Sheol cannot thank you. Death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your truth. The living, the living man, he shall praise you as I do this day. The Father shall make known your truth to, to the children. So just being thankful for our lives, for another day, another year, more time we can spend with our family, teach our children, our grandchildren. If we look at Isaiah 51, verse 3, For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Being thankful for the comfort of the Lord and being thankful for the assurance of our salvation and how he has changed our lives, made our lives so much better for knowing him. If we look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And thanks to God we can. We can rejoice, we can pray, and we can give thanks for everything and in every situation. So if anyone has any need and would like to come forward, please do so while we stand and sing.